Father, we come before you in this moment, our hearts ready, Lord, to be molded by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word. Father, we come because a study is not merely an exercise in filling our mind with facts. Father, there is no pride here, I hope. Father, we are not prideful about our devotion to study of the Word. No more, Father, than a patient can be prideful about taking their medicine. We are not here, Father, because we deserve to be here. We are here, Father, because we know that we are so unworthy. We are so unlike you. We are so far from the standard of holiness that you expect and demand for those who would come into your presence. And, Father, we are thankful that that standard, though we can't meet it, was met in your Son, and that your Son, the Word Himself, is our focus this morning, that we would desire, Father, to know from His words what it means, Father, to be righteous, what it means, Father, to know holiness. And though our attempts to meet it in this life will always fall short, Father, that does not alleviate from us, Father, the responsibility to seek after righteousness and to seek after Your Word, that we may know, Father, how to be more like You. And here we are, gathered in your name, with the word open before us. And I pray, Lord, that as we go into it, your power would be shown through my words, not my Father, but yours. That the word, Father, would be spoken boldly so that in the hearts of those gathered, there could be real change, Father, and in mine as well. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for this time. And we give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is our fifth week in Luke chapter 6, and thankfully for some, perhaps this is our last uh, week in this chapter. It's been a good chapter, though. You know we've been working through it almost as a student, like the disciples themselves. Jesus is in the middle of giving them essentially Christianity 101, righteousness 101, which for us may seem a bit odd. Why would the disciples need something like that? Well, remember, your view of the disciples is probably the view of where they were at the end of their lives as they wrote the epistles and as they went out in ministering to the world. But consider where they are now at this point in chapter 6 of Luke. They're at the beginning. They're very much absorbed in a world and in a culture that did not appreciate what true righteousness was, that had been taught time and time again by religious leaders, Pharisees, if you will, about what, that, about what righteousness really was. And from their perspective, it was a completely incorrect perspective. So Jesus has been working to lay out for these 12 apostles what it means to actually be a believer in Jesus, what it means to pursue righteousness, and then what it's going to take for them in preparation to serve in ministering the gospel to a lost and dying world. Now, in the first four weeks of this chapter, as we've studied through chapter 6, we've listened to Jesus teaching his disciples, about how different, how very different their perspective on righteousness needs to be from what the world around them has been teaching them their whole lives. First, we had the Beatitudes at the beginning of this chapter, which, if you remember, were lessons on how true faith actually brings sorrow and repentance in our lives, along with a hopeful expectation for our restoration at some point, for our rewards in eternity. But Jesus puts all our worldly views on their heads, if you will. Rather than talking about what we have to feel good about in this world, he reminds us that if we really understand our sin and if we really understand what righteousness requires, we would be weeping over our sin. We would be hungry for true righteousness. We would look for the Holy Spirit to fill us with those things. And then the next week we talked about how Jesus told them the difference between creating their faith through their own works, in other words, depending upon themselves, and doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that in the difference they would be hated by the world. That as they rejected the world's ways of righteousness and adopted in faith the lessons that Christ was going to give them, they were going to find themselves at odds with the world for the sake of Christ. They would be the enemies of the world. But he added this interesting fact. He said the fact that persecution will come upon them because of their faith should never dissuade them from actually pressing on with the gospel message. You can't use the fact that you're persecuted for your faith as an excuse not to go out and minister to the unbelieving world with the gospel message. It's a fact that it will happen, but it's never an excuse to shrink from that responsibility. You're going to be a target, but you cannot shrink back and you cannot respond in kind. 
You cannot give an eye for an eye, as the Old Testament taught. You cannot give a tooth for a tooth. You cannot respond in kind as the world would do, but rather in love and in generosity, Christ told us you need to forgive them. And then finally, last week, Jesus reminded his disciples that when they show mercy to those who hate them, when they actually do this thing he's asking them to do, they're doing it merely because they're following in Christ's footsteps. They're simply doing what the Father did first on their behalf. For the Father was willing to overlook our hatred of him and give his Son over to death for us. So we now, with this incomparable gift of salvation, we are to become like him. And remember, the term Christian means little Christ. So in that sense... As Christ was willing to go before his enemies, forgive them, though they spat on him, though they persecuted him, though they eventually murdered him, he did all those things in advance of them believing in him. Because he was willing to to persevere through persecution because the message was too important. Likewise, you are now a little Christ, so to speak. You're a Christian. You mimic his pattern. You go into the face of persecution. You go into the face of hatred. You don't let that stop you. You continue to love your enemy, bringing them the gospel message because your hope is that you will penetrate into their heart by the power of the Holy Spirit just as God did yours. It's in mimicking Christ's ultimate sacrifice that you take the gospel message out to the world that hates it even now. Maybe with the opportunity to participate with the Holy Spirit in bringing someone to faith. That's the recap. See, you didn't even have to be here the last four weeks. You could have come today. Had the whole thing laid out for you just like that. Come every fifth week, you're in good shape. No, don't do that. Now we're going to begin to see how Jesus is going to work to reset the disciples' expectation about their teachers, about how they view their teachers and others, and on the basic issue of judgment. And this is a key issue for the Christian today. I would argue that probably nothing undoes the fellowship, the harmony among believers, than this instinct that we all share to judge. And judgment will be the topic for today. This is radical stuff. It's about to get even more radical as we go into chapter 6, verse 36. Let's begin reading there. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour it into your lap, a good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And we have to pause there for a while because we're going to talk at length about judgment, but in the context of these verses. Now, you may have noticed that I began in a verse that we actually ended in last week, verse 36. That was the last verse we studied last week. And I did this because verse 36 is actually an important bridge verse. Bridge meaning connecting two ideas together. It bridges first... The explanation uh, or the verses we talked about last week, it it bridges what we talked last week into what we're going to talk this week. Jesus says, show kindness, show compassion to your enemies because God was once merciful to you while you were his enemy. That's what we taught last week. And he ended by saying, be merciful just as your father was merciful. In other words, do for others what he's already done for you in that sense. But it also is going to help us understand where we're headed now in the verses for this morning. It explains the meaning of the next series of verses. When confronting an enemy who hates you for your belief in Jesus, be merciful and do not judge them for their hatred. And that's the first thing I want you to notice in these verses. The term judgment here is being applied in a very specific sense. It is not universal. It is specific. And let's consider what it's specific about. It begins with the audience. Who in light of these verses, are we talking about judging? Who is he telling us not to judge? Well, the verses all refer back to the group mentioned previously, mentioned earlier. Notice in verse 38, it says, they. It's a plural group. Some plural group of people we're judging and we shouldn't. And following it back in the text, going up a couple of verses, the group you find is your enemies. All right, well, that's still vague. Who are the enemies? Who are the enemies we're talking about here that, are, that Christ is saying we should not judge. Well, remember from the last few weeks, we've watched as Christ has carefully built his teaching around a discussion of two kinds of people. We've said this in here, I know, on many occasions, there are two kinds of people in the world, right? And this discussion we've had at broad lengths about 
the unbelieving world versus the believing world and that there's really no other way to divide up humanity. No other way that really matters anyway. These believers who by faith in Christ have been changed are now adopted sons of God. They're in the family of God, Paul tells us. Then there's the rest of the world, the sons of disobedience, enemies of God, a group that we were once a part of, Paul says. I've heard a man say, and I think it's a good way to put it, there's no such thing really as an unbeliever. There's just believers and not yet believers. Reasoning being, of course, that on one day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. One day, in eternity, every person who's ever been alive will know Jesus is Lord and believe it. The problem is, if they wait until that moment to believe it, it's too late. Our role, Christ has given to us the role of going out and trying to change as many of those hearts and minds now by the power of the Holy Spirit, not in our own power, and do it before it's too late. But for now, we can classify the believer and the unbeliever as these two great divides in humanity. Once we change sides, starting with the son of disobedience, we are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit into a believer. We join the other side. We become an adopted son of God. Once we do that, we are now considered an enemy from the first group. Just as this group is opposed to God, hates God, Scripture tells us, you once were an enemy of God, Paul tells us in Romans. Once you're converted and you're over here as an adopted son of God, you've joined the enemy from the perspective of the unbeliever. And that's why we will be hated as much as they hate God himself, though they may not even realize it. So our enemies, spiritually speaking, are the world of unbelievers. Well, that's a pretty big group, isn't it? (laughs) I'm not really helping us define down this group in any very finite terms. Well, that's not Christ's point. His point here is not to give you a specific sense in which you forgive somebody one day and another day you don't. You judge someone on this moment, but you don't on another time. He's speaking in broad spiritual terms. Do not judge the enemies when they are persecuting you, when they are hating you, because that's all they know how to do. Look at the entirety of verse 37. He says, don't judge, but he also says, don't condemn. And then he adds that we should be prepared to pardon our enemies. Judging, condemning, pardoning, for what? I mean, what is it we are pardoning them for? What is it we should not condemn them for? Well, what did Jesus say they were likely to do to you? What made them enemies? It's their attack on your faith, of course. Remember, he says, when they persecute you for my name's sake, he said that earlier in this chapter, the focus here is on judging someone who attacks us because of our faith, who makes their, uh, uh, their hatred of us known in some way because of our faith. How are we going to judge someone who attacks our faith? What kind of judgment comes to mind? What is he, I, want to get, I want to keep drilling us down into this because there is a very specific thought and, and a very specific resulting action that we are likely to take in the face of persecution from our enemies if we're not careful to remember his words here and obey them. How are we likely to condemn them? How and why would we need to pardon them? What would that look like? Remember, these are the apostles Jesus is talking to. These are the disciples, his witnesses, the men who are going to bring the good news to the world. And he's preparing them for that mission. Should they only bring the good news of the gospel to the people who are nice to them? Should they only go to someone who's receptive? Should they only be willing to spread the good news to someone who embraces it right from the start? Only to those who are already righteous or predisposed toward righteousness? That's how the gospel is supposed to be shared? If we were to take offense at our rough treatment at the hands of our enemies because of the name of of Christ, because of the gospel, and then in our anger from that reaction, in our dislike of their hatred, in our reaction against their persecution, if we were then to make a judgment about them and essentially condemn them in our own minds by refusing to bring them the gospel, by looking at their sin and their hatred as an excuse for why we don't need to bring them the gospel, why we can pass them by, so to speak, then we, in a sense, have made ourselves out to be their judges in eternal terms, judging them eternally. We may feel justified or, or in fact, just scared or embarrassed at the ridicule. And as a result, we assume God has no intentions of bringing these people to faith. And I don't need to be subjected to this hatred anymore. I can move on to more receptive pastures. And then we've come basically to the point of making a judgment about them and their eternal destiny. And therefore, we've condemned them. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying, you can't do that. You can't stop short. That's not right. God alone is the judge. 
in eternal terms, of course. You know, we, we never have the opportunity to ever consider anybody unsavable. There is no time in anyone's life where you can stop and say, that person is a goner for sure. There's no hope for that person anymore. There's never an opportunity for, to, to do that because everyone is unsavable. Everyone is unsavable apart from the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. You yourselves were once unsavable. Because you couldn't do it in your own power. And no other man could do it for you. You were unsavable apart from God. But for whatever reason, whatever gracious reason reason God had, He, through the Holy Spirit, changed your heart and brought you faith and brought you into a new relationship. Praise be to the Lord. So how can we ever say you won't do the same thing for somebody else? The classic example that must be on the minds of most people in here right now, the thief on the cross. Do you know the day before the thief went to the cross? The day before he was put in jail? The day when he was still out being a thief? Doing what he did with his other buddies? How many of those men with him would have looked at him and said, you know, you're going to go to heaven one day? How many people the day before he was crucified would have predicted that man was going to be saved by God? But God had a plan for him that included that the day of his death he'd be about six feet or ten feet away from the Lord of the universe. And that relationship would be established in that moment. Uh, What kind of miracle is that? How can you ever look at somebody then, even on their deathbed, and not believe the possibility still exists that God might bring them faith? And then in our own sort of cynical moment, if it happens, what are we likely to do? And it happens to me all the time. I I have to actually work hard to overcome this instinct. You hear that somebody's been saved on their deathbed, they've had a deathbed conversion, and you, you back in your mind, what do you think? Hmm, I hope that's true, you know. Seems too convenient. Guy was a wreck his whole life, and on the last moment of his life, he has this conversion. Yeah, right. You know, fortunately, we don't have to agree for it to be true. But the fact is that God says when we do that, we're judging. And the reason it's so important, the reason he says don't do this, is because of how it influences our behavior. How when we get a perspective about somebody and their eternal destiny, it tends to influence how we treat them. The neighbor who's so depraved, why would I bother going next door and preaching the good news? Or the one who's so hardened and so turned off to faith and religion and is so, uh, so much an enemy of Christ and all that they say and do, well, why would I go before that person and ever give them an opportunity to mock me and to mock Christ? Well, Jesus says, don't throw a pearl before swine. There is a point at which you should back off, perhaps. Wait for a better day. We're not giving up on the person. We're simply looking for the best opportunity. That's far cry from saying that person's a lost cause and moving on for good. There's a big difference there. When you are prone to judge because of their hatred of you and of your faith, you are also then prone to act that out in ways that are not appropriate. Is Is there any surprise in your mind for the explanation I've given out of the text? In other words, in hearing how the text itself explains and and unfolds Jesus' meaning, does it take you by surprise? I ask that because I think for most people, they've probably heard these verses so misused in their own Christian experience that they're surprised to hear the actual context in which it was intended, talking about how we treat enemies of the gospel, talking about how it influences our willingness to carry the message to them. Gee, that's not the way somebody brought these up to me. You know, here the the most common way we probably hear it get misused is we take time to maybe correct or or rebuke or point out a problem with a fellow believer, hopefully done in the right way, with the right heart, with an intent to, to help them see their sin and perhaps, you know, repent of it. And as soon as you might bring something up to them, their immediate response is what? Jesus said not to judge. You know, you can't be my judge. You can't judge me like that. Now you understand how they're misusing that verse, right? It's just bad use of Scripture. We've already established here that first Jesus is talking about how believers are treating unbelievers. So that's where you'd have to be using this in context first. Secondly, from the context, it's clear that Jesus is not talking about how we make discernments or assessments or call it, if you will, judgments, but about appropriate versus inappropriate behavior on the part of a believer. There's nothing in that that he's prohibiting. In fact, the the New Testament itself, most of the letters written by Paul, certainly written by Peter, James, talk at length at times about how we are as brothers to sharpen one another, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, to be held accountable to one another. 
Not in, a, not in the way in which we want to go finding out the, the dirt that's under your bed or the skeletons that are in your closet. It's not some unhealthy exercise on our part to root out any secret you're holding, but rather when your sin is evident and it's hurting you or the body, it's our obligation to go to one another in love and attempt to bring those things to the surface so that the Holy Spirit can deal with them in our hearts and we as a fellowship can grow in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord, as Paul puts it. But when someone responds to that kind of correction, or coming from another believer, with comments about, you don't judge me, it, that's simply a smokescreen. That's simply them trying to avoid dealing with the truth of the matter, with their own sin. And in that, they're only hurting themselves in the long run. But if I left these verses now without talking about the other side of the coin, I, I'd leave you with only half the story. And the other side of the coin is this. This area of, if you will, judging others' behavior is an area that's ripe for all kinds of error and misuse, all kinds of abuse in the church. There is a thin line between rightfully calling out a brother for their sin and, on the other hand, incorrectly applying some legalistic rule that's merely intended to try to measure righteousness in some human way. That's legalism as opposed to some healthy effort within the church to purge itself of sin. Legalism is the cancer, I believe, in many churches both today and throughout the ages. It starts fairly simple, starts simply enough, it's pretty innocent. Usually it's just some rule for good order or for discipline within the body, well intended, perhaps even a good rule. But soon those rules grow and they expand and they become the yokes around the necks of the members of the church that if you're not carrying that burden with you at all times, others in the fellowship look upon you and judge you in a negative light. They assume that you're not following all the rules, therefore you're not a good Christian. In other words, they start to define what it means to be a brother in the Lord by how well you keep the rules rather than what's in your heart. In fact, if you find yourself, and I think this is a good healthy challenge for all of us, if you find yourself spending a significant amount of time thinking about what other Christians are doing wrong, if your thoughts continually come back on this process of evaluating your brothers and sisters in the Lord on the basis of what they're doing, right and wrong, and you're keeping a scorecard in your mind, maybe even, if, if that's a predominant thought in your mind, then I think you've got a problem. Because either you're in the wrong fellowship, and God has put on your heart a burden to be dissatisfied, to feel disconnected, to just not feel at home with the group of people you're gathering with, and they're and that's showing itself in you by your dissatisfaction with them and all that they're doing. If that's a feeling in your heart, perhaps God's telling you, this isn't the fellowship for you. I have another place I want you to be. It's either that or you're just investing way too much time in other people's problems at the expense of considering your own. But maybe you say that's not a problem for you. Maybe you would say that I'm never doing that. I, it's not an issue for me, Steve. I don't know who you're talking to, but it's not me. Well, Jesus knew better than that because even in the way he begins verse 37, when he says, do not judge, in the Greek, the language being used there in the Greek, there's only two words there. It's krinome, krinome, and that's the present imperative tense of the verb judge. Present imperative, meaning an ongoing present activity that he adds an imperative to, and then the negative, may, meaning stop this present activity. So really, the way to put it in English would be stop judging. Not don't start, but stop judging. Because he knew instinctively that in the hearts of every man and woman, there is a natural desire to judge others. He's not saying that don't think about doing it. He's saying stop doing it. Stop what you're already prone to do. Now, there, there is a second way in which you can misuse these verses. And ironically, it's, it's when an unbeliever says to a believer that they should not judge in response to some standard or in, in response to some expectation that the Christian is perhaps laying on the unbeliever. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. When you have an unbeliever throw your lifestyle back in your face and... Add to that, you know, you have no right to judge me and what I choose to do. You have no right to apply your standards to me. You've, have you heard this before or heard somebody on TV maybe say this in response to a Christian standard? The examples I might give are, for example, perhaps you have an unsaved friend at work that you know. And they come up to you one time and say, hey, I 
Steve, I just want to let you know I've been cheating on my wife. I got this girl on the side. She's really cool. I want to, you know, starts talking about it, right? And then maybe in that moment, you know, you just respond in surprise and you say, you know, you really shouldn't be doing that. What about your poor wife? You know, you should be loyal to your wife. And of course, in that moment, the guy says, who are you to judge me? Or maybe an unchristian neighbor says, Hey, I figured out a way I can tap into your cable and I can borrow your cable signal. You mind if I just run a wire across from your backyard? And you say, yeah, I kind of do. That's, that's stealing. I really don't think you should do that. Who are you to judge me? Or maybe for some of the younger folks here at school, somebody says, hey, can I look at your homework right before class? I didn't really get mine finished. I'd like to just see what you, your answers are. Would you mind? They'll never know. And you say, you know, I, I'd prefer not. It's cheating after all. In each case, if that other person turns to you and says, well, who are you to be my judge? Yes, their statement misunderstands Scripture. But that's no surprise, right? They're an unbeliever. What I think is more telling, though, is part of the mistake in that exchange is ours. Part of the mistake is ours. Yes, your observations about their sin may have been correct. And, you know, your warning about the problems with that sin may have been very helpful, may have been useful. But are your comments really going to solve the real problem? By telling that neighbor that cheating or, or telling that neighbor is stealing or telling him that he's committing adultery, are you really fixing the true problem here with that individual? I mean, they are sinning. We've said already their sin is bad. But, folks, that's what sinners do. Sinners... Sin. That's where they get the name from. And before they know Christ, that's all they can do. That's all sinners do is sin perpetually at every moment. There is none who are righteous. No, not one. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Their good works are but filthy rags. There's not some scale here. It's not as though the unbeliever is halfway to good because they're a different, better person than the next person. They're all bad, just like you and I were before faith. And they will sin. So giving them different things to do is not going to help them in the long run, because they can't work their way to salvation. If you convince your neighbor not to cheat or to steal cable, if you convince the student at school not to cheat, well, that's fine for the moment. Maybe that has some momentary value for you and for them. But if that's where it ends... They've got nothing that will last. That work of doing the right thing in the moment buys them zip in eternity. Only if it eventually leads to a discussion about the gospel and then you bring them the knowledge of the truth that can save them, then maybe that moment actually had some lasting purpose. But short of that, short of that, it's the analogy I've used before. It's lipstick on a pig. You know, it does no lasting change and just dresses them up for a minute. In fact, I'll tell you, the worst thing you can do, the worst thing I have found you can do with an unbeliever is convince them to do what you want them to do. If you convince them to change their behavior in the ways you think are righteous, you've just confused them. Now they're thinking, if I do those things, I'm righteous. That's what it means to be a Christian. You've warped their sense of what our faith is about. You've turned what is faith into merely acts, into works. I would argue that you'd be much better off spending time on what the heart believes and let the behaviors follow as a function of sanctification of the work of the Holy Spirit after faith, just as he's doing for you now. Rather than try to reverse that and say, let's clean you up, let's get rid of all these bad behaviors, then you're going to be good enough to be a Christian. And we laugh at it, but that's what we do. That's what a lot of Christians do. What they need is the gospel message. Maybe for the student who says, I need to cheat, you would turn and say, how about this instead? How about next time, let's go and work together on this. I'll come to your house, I'll help you with it, I'll work you through those problems, and that way you'll have it done right and you'll know what the, you know, what the book says. You'll actually be prepared. And maybe the student in the midst of that will say, well, gee, no one's ever offered to do that to me before. That's really kind. I, thank you. And there opens up a friendship from which then the relationship can move toward a discussion of the gospel. And the same for the neighbor, the same for the guy at work. Look for a way to build on that moment not judge them in the moment. Jesus paid the price for them, just as he did for you. And if they believe in him, they'll get the same thing you got out of that faith. They don't need to work their way to heaven any more than you did. In fact, I want you to note that this change 
in the disciples, this fundamental change in their thinking that Christ is trying to create through these verses, just as he is trying to do for us here today, is why Jesus says that if they don't judge or condemn others, then they themselves won't be condemned or judged. Because the only kind of person who would act this way toward their enemy, who would be willing in the face of persecution to love them back and to continue to bring the gospel message, to not relent on that basis, the only one who would possibly be willing to do that is someone who's already had their heart changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, who believes the words Christ is giving in these verses and understands the significance of that relationship. Those are the kind of people who, by their willingness to forgive their enemies, make known their own changed hearts. They prove who they are by the fact that they're willing to do this very unusual, counterintuitive kind of thing. They give witness to their salvation by this action. That's what he's saying when he says, if you don't judge, you won't be judged. If you don't condemn your enemy, then you won't be condemned. If you're willing to pardon your enemy, then you're going to be pardoned. Not because you've earned it. Not because the work of pardoning or of failing to judge is somehow buying you salvation. Not at all. But because those works, when they're done, reveal the heart of a true believer. They're the only, they're the only person in the world who would do these things on a consistent basis. Now, as we move on, before we read the next verse, I just want to take a moment and note one other thing out of verse 38. When left in its context, now we read only three verses today, granted, but we've been studying this book and we've been studying this chapter as a context. When you take verse 38 in its context, connected to verse 37, the discussion of forgiveness, and to verse 39 and what follows, which is a discussion of judgment, then it's clear, undoubtedly clear, that verse 38 is about the topic of forgiveness. It is not about wealth. Verse 38 has nothing to do with money. And the fact that it's misused that way tells you something about the heart of the people who teach it. Because it's so obviously not about money when you read it in its context. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to read this part of Luke 6 and know that he's talking about handing out forgiveness and getting it back in in the same way that you give it out. It's connecting those thoughts in the midst of that chapter. Unscrupulous teachers, I know, and you've heard them on TV, I'm sure. You may have even sat in their presence on some occasions, I'm not sure. But you have no doubt heard of men and women who would teach and cite this verse, among others, that if you want to be rich, Give a lot of money to the church. Folks, if that worked, I would do it. No, I'm just, just kidding. But seriously, if, what motive do you think is in the back of their minds? What desire is driving them to do that? When it's so obvious what it really means. We're not talking about here about a simple mistake. I don't believe that. I do not believe we're talking about people who read the verse and saw his money and then, oh, it was just a misunderstanding. Sorry. They'd have to be blinder than blind. No, what they did was they found a verse that said what they needed it to say so that they could support something they had already wanted to teach. It is manipulation of Scripture. It is not honest ministry. Some even turn it around and say God will not bless us financially unless we are tithing properly. Folks, the Scripture said we should tithe. Tithe as God leads you to. Enough said. Putting aside... The, that issue. Let, let me just emphasize that the principles of Scripture that are contained in this teaching about money in general are not biblical. They're not going to be stated based on the truth of Scripture. The only way you can find some form of biblical support to suggest that God wants to make us rich and that He'll do it on the basis of how much we're giving away ourselves. The only way you can possibly build that argument out of Scripture is to grab verses like this one completely out of context and teach them incorrectly. That's the only way you can do it because that's what the Bible says. It it is not a book about teaching us how to be rich. And this is a good example of why I think we should continue to emphasize here study of Scripture verse by verse by verse in context. Not letting our own selfish, sinful desires take hold. And as we pull Scripture out of context and bend it to our own desires, we misuse it. We'll never do that here as long as I'm teaching, I pray.
But now let's move on. Jesus begins to end his discourse, and we're going to, as I said, we will finish this chapter today. He's going to end it by going back essentially to where he started at the beginning of this chapter, to a discussion of the false religious leaders of his day. Look at Luke 6, verse 39. He also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye? Do you not notice that log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take that speck out of, that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see that log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Well, Jesus returns here to this wedge that he's been driving between the apostles and the religious leaders of the day. Keep in mind, Jesus appears as a rabbi. He really, to many in their culture, appeared to be just another one of the Pharisees. Now, we know different, obviously, and if they ever listened to what he said, they would, they would have figured that out too, sooner or later. But just from who he was, the position he had in their uh, culture, he was like them, for the most part. He looked like them, he acted like them in the sense of having students and moving around, teaching. That was very common, actually. That's why people often addressed him as rabbi or teacher. He was just seen in that mold. Likewise, then, his students, the disciples, they would have begun to see themselves in the mold of the students that followed the other rabbis around. They just kind of saw themselves as the same group of what was common in their day. And Jesus has, as one of his goals, the desire to set apart in their minds who they are and who he is from what they've seen around them in the culture, to drive a wedge between this group that he's creating and the group that existed already. And he offers here, as the begin of this passage I read, he offers here a short one-verse parable that a blind man cannot guide the blind out of their blindness. A blind man cannot guide the blind to anything greater. And he's beginning here again to talk about the Pharisees and about the other religious leaders of the day. These are the men who were spiritually blind. In their day, they were blind spiritually to the truth, though they thought they knew everything, though they thought they were experts. And not knowing the truth meant they were not seeking the truth. In other words, there was no desire on their part to learn anything different than what they already knew. And then, on top of that, they were busy telling others that they should follow them in order to know the truth. So you have these men who are spiritually blind, they don't know the truth, they've got students, and they're telling the students, do what I do and you'll know the truth. How ironic, considering they themselves didn't know it. But if they themselves are blind, then, that would mean that the other men who follow them will also be lost. Those who choose to follow a blind man are going to perish with him in his blindness. And that's what he says. They will find themselves fall into the pit, meaning into the pit of hell, into damnation, without the hope of knowing the truth, because they're following someone who's blind. Christ then follows that statement. It's a pretty simple, pretty uh, obvious statement. stands on its own. But he follows that with an equally short statement of fact that pupils can only learn as much as their teachers know. That's also a fairly straightforward statement. But more than that, a pupil will be molded after their teacher. It's not simply that you're only going to know as much as they can teach you. It's also the case, though, that you're going to begin to follow in a pattern. You're going to look like them. You're going to talk like them. Your life will begin to reflect those you follow, those you look up to in ministry, in leadership, in teaching. It's not just their words and their teaching that you're going to adopt. Typically, people, if, they, if they're close to that person, if they have a lot of respect for that person, they'll actually mold their lives to some extent after that person, for better and worse. That's just the nature of a student-teacher relationship. But now here's the question. Why did Jesus interrupt his discourse on forgiveness and judgment with these two verses? I mean, they're obvious statements. We can agree with them, I guess. But why? Why, why did this come into the discussion at this point? It's because he's not just tearing down 
generations of false teaching on righteousness, he's also trying to tear down the authority of the teachers in that day. The men themselves, in other words, not just the teaching that he's already been addressing. And so the disciples were going to have some confusion, if he doesn't do this, about whose teachings are true. Remember, Jesus is only with these guys for about three years. The religious leaders of their day had existed for decades and centuries prior to this moment and will continue to exist for some time afterward. Even today in the culture of the Jewish nation, you can find people, Orthodox Jews, who fulfill this role of being a Pharisee. So in order for him to do that, in order for him to tear down in the minds of the disciples the authority and the teaching of these men, he has to illustrate the dangers, the dangers of them, the apostles, judging others. Huh? How do I tear down the authority of the Pharisees by illustrating the danger of judging others? Well, it's because the real danger in judging others is not in how you treat them. Hear me on this. The danger in judging others is not in how you treat them. That's just a small part of it. The danger in it is in how you see yourself. As we become more and more comfortable with judging others, we're going to feel more comfortable deciding who's righteous. Who it is that's not up to our standards. We're going to feel more comfortable about our own situation. You know, no one stands in judgment over others and at the same time thinks themselves guilty of the same offense. We can't do that. You, you naturally feel hypocritical when you do that. The way we solve that problem in our own minds, we don't feel guilty. The more you judge others, the more you'll see yourself as being Un, uh, being above reproach, without need for judgment. Sinless, in other words. It's the natural consequence of putting yourself in a position of judge. You don't want to feel like you have anything wrong with you while you're busy judging others. It's the natural consequence. It become the calling card, in fact, of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were so self-righteous, they were so, they were so sure that they were sinless and above reproach because they were so good at judging others. They go hand in hand. And they had become so consumed with their roles as judges of society and of men that they were virtually sinless in their own eyes. And here's the problem with thinking that about yourself. Number one, you're wrong. Number two, you don't have need for a Savior if you're sinless. When you're so righteous that you can stand in judgment over other people's sin, you're not going to be thinking in your own mind about the need to be saved from your own sin. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. Jesus says that while you're busy working, this analogy is so well understood, this speck in the eye versus the log in your own eye. We've said this many times. I'm sure it comes up quite often, even in the unbelieving world. It's such a famous statement of Christ. But I want you to think about it in some very specific terms. He says that while you're busy working to remove the speck out of your brother's eye, speck, karphos in the Greek, it literally means a small, thin, dried stalk of a plant. So, I want you to get this vision, visual picture in your mind, because this is what was in the mind of the disciples when they first heard Jesus say this. They heard him saying, you've got this tiny little wisp of a stalk sticking out from your eye. Okay, so that's an absurd kind of view all by itself, right? So this is a little stick like this. And meanwhile, that's what your brother has. Your brother has this little stick, kind of a little wispy stick, and you kind of notice it. Oh, hell, let me help you get that out of your eye, right? But then he says, the person who is actually going out to correct this other problem, they have, and I'll use a, a favorite word of my daughter's, they have this ginormous, it's a great word, I love that word, they have a ginormous log coming out of their own eye, dokos in the Greek, and it literally means a beam of lumber, like an unfinished tree that's been felled and you haven't sent it through the lumber mill yet. Okay, So in a moment, Jesus has said, you're, you're trying to get close enough to this person to pull this little stalk out of their eye. Meanwhile, you've got this beam you're projecting out of your face everywhere you turn such that you can't even get close to the person to pull out what you're trying. It's an absurd, ridiculous, funny thing. And that's the point. I would have imagined that as he spoke those words, the disciples would have laughed. They would have chuckled at the thought of this, of this picture in their minds. I mean, the absurdity of it is obvious, right? It'd be like an eye surgeon, a blind eye surgeon doing eye surgery. The irony, right? You've got... Someone who's there to correct your vision and they're blind themselves. And they need their vision in order to do their job. It's the, it's the height of absurdity. And of course he says we should be careful to consider this effect in ourselves. This effect of becoming so good at judging others 
that we lose complete sight of the fact that we're just as culpable. We're just as much in need of correction, if not more so, than they are. Now, if you have a heart to root out sin, you know, there's, there's no difficulty in becoming someone's judge. It's easy. But there's no value in it either. There's no value in it for them or for you. And yet, if you are interested in rooting out sin, if you have a heart to want to see sin done away with, well, you have a perfect opportunity in yourself. And you'll never run out of material. All right? That's the good news. If that's really your heart to go finding sin and dealing with it, work on yourself and you'll be satisfied until you die because you'll never run out of opportunities. And then, if you should one day achieve perfection, a day when there is no log sticking out of your own eye, well, then he says, you'll be qualified at log removal. If that day should ever come that you're sinless, you'd be the perfect person to take the speck out of people's eyes because you've obviously become very qualified at log removal. But, of course, we know that day won't come short of our glorification. So his point is obvious. Don't be in the business of trying to help other people with their sin. Not because they should be happy with their sin, but because you shouldn't be happy with yours. And the more you judge others, the less likely you are to think of yourself as having a problem. Now, this parable of the two trees that follows is really two issues in view here. Jesus, first, he's warning the disciples to judge their teachers by their works. It's a very sensible thing. Are they hypocritical? As was the case, of course, for that person who's trying to remove the speck while having a log in their own eye. He's saying that's a judgment about your teachers. Are they living a life that reflects their own teaching? Or are they hypocritical? You know, if I, as a teacher here, well, first of all, let me state up front, I'm not perfect. So if you're looking for a perfect teacher, don't bother coming back. It won't be me. And so we know instinctively that's not our standard. It's not that God elevates perfect people into ministry and therefore that's why we follow them. No, it's, you don't follow me in any event. You may listen to my teaching because of some value you get out of it by God's power through me. But apart from that, there's nothing about me that you should necessarily mimic, at least in, uh, as far as the overall person is concerned. Now, there may be some aspects of my life that I may have made some advancement in terms of contending with sin, and maybe there's some good opportunity to mimic me there. I guarantee you there's plenty where I haven't. You want to ignore those, you know. The point is not that your standards are against what I do or don't do. It's against what Christ says in the Word. But... If, as a teacher, I'm completely devoid of any effort on my part to try to conform to what I teach, if my life and my teaching look nothing alike, well, then Christ says that's a fair way to evaluate that teacher. And he says, if that teacher is hypocritical, if they bear bad fruit but try to act like a good tree, it can't be the truth. He says, stay away from those teachers and from their teaching because that bad fruit is evidence of a fountain of unbelief producing that bad fruit. He says, where does evil come? The evil fruit comes from an evil, unbelieving heart. Now, remember, we're talking about broad terms here. First time I sin is not proof that necessarily I'm an unbeliever, right? What we're looking for here is a broad pattern, a consistent pattern. Things that if you look at the person over time, it's pretty clear we're looking at a bad tree. So it may take time. But the flip side of that is when you see that evidence, you're required to act. You cannot continue to make excuses for why you would sit under that teaching. Matthew, in his gospel, in both the 7th and the 12th chapters, records a very similar saying from Christ in both chapters. Here's what He records him saying that basically the same things Luke just taught here. But in Matthew's account, he's specifically addressing the Pharisees, accusing them of having false motives. If you go back into those two chapters and study through them, you'll find these same comments about a tree bearing fruit that tells you about their heart. And when Matthew records them, he's talking about specifically addressing the Pharisees. I believe that's who is in view here as well, the pharisaical teachers of Jesus' day. Christ is warning the disciples to stay clear of them. But Jesus here, the second thing I think he's telling us here is he's also reminding us of what should be our real goal for those people that we just talked about a minute ago, those people with the log in their own eye, what should our real goal be for them? Or a log in our eye and a speck in theirs? I mean, if we do care about that speck, though we understand we have a share in that sin as well, we have our own problem. But if we still have a concern for that other person's sin, what should we do? 
If we want them to produce good fruit, in other words, they're a tree just as you and I are in, in the case of this parable. If we want their tree to produce good fruit, and instead we see a life of sin, we see neighbors stealing cable, we see friends at work stealing our homework, cheating off our homework. If we want that behavior to change, if we want to turn that bad fruit into good fruit, what is Jesus telling us we have to do? They're going to need a heart that can produce good fruit. Because as long as they have this evil and unbelieving heart, they have no hope to produce anything other than bad fruit. So, they need a heart transplant. That's the only cure for this disease that they have. Which leads us again back to the gospel message. You see how it all fits here for Jesus? He keeps coming back and training his disciples on the same basic point. It's a heart issue. Deal with the heart issue. Yeah, they're going to hate you. Don't give up. Don't judge them for them for it. They are you the way you used to be. Who are you to say that they're beyond reach? He wants us to be his disciples. He wanted them to be his messengers. He isn't sending us to his friends. He's sending us to his enemies. And though they hate us, you love them. Though they reject you, you don't condemn them. Let's go on in Luke uh, 6, verse 46. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. Well, finally, Jesus ends his discourse here with some of the most sobering verses, I think, in this chapter. He asks us, why would someone call him Lord, Lord, but not do as he says? In Jesus' day, this title of Lord, it was actually a very common title in Judaism. If you've read through the Old Testament, you've noticed at times Abraham was called Lord. At times, the king of Shechem was called Lord. Or at other points, the king of Gerar is called Lord. There is a title in the Jewish culture of Lord that is simply a title given to a man of authority or any time we want to show great respect for someone, we call them Lord. It's uh, like your majesty. It's a title of deference. But of course, that doesn't mean that because you use the word Lord, that that the person using it in the scripture was intending it the same way you and I might use it today, talking about our, our Lord, Jesus Christ. We mean it in a very specific sense. We mean he is the savior of the world. He is God himself. But in their day, it didn't necessarily mean that. And so this was going to be a central problem for the disciples in Jesus' day. As they begin to go out, as they begin to plant their early church, and as they often would have to confront men over the gospel message, they had to be careful about what those men meant when they said, Lord, Lord. I mean, Jesus isn't worried about this. He can tell the difference. It's not as though Jesus says you need to make sure they use the term right, otherwise I don't get the right credit or some silliness like that. It's not Jesus that's worried about making a uh, misjudgment about who means it the right way. It's the disciples that need to be clear on this. As they ministered, they needed to have some discernment about what that term was meant to mean in the minds of the people who use it. Just as the Pharisees would approach Jesus in his day and call him rabbi or teacher or even in some cases Lord, They didn't mean it the way they should. In fact, they almost meant it in a sarcastic way. They didn't mean it as someone who was truly Lord. And just as with the false teachers in his day, Jesus says to those who are truly his followers, we can be known, we can know those teachers by their actions. He told us earlier, those from a good tree will produce good fruit. Likewise here now, he says, those teachers who really believe me or really believe the words Lord when they call me by that name, You'll know who they are, too, by their actions, because they'll do as I say. Those who are willing to do as I say are the ones who truly mean the words, Lord, when they call me Lord. Does anybody ever mention there's two kinds of people in the world? There are those who hear the words of the gospel, the words of Jesus, and they base all their hope and all their trust for eternity in those words. That's their whole hope lies in what the gospel brings them. They don't believe in Jesus and Buddha. They don't believe in Jesus and their good works. They don't believe in Jesus and they tithe and go to church. They just believe that what Jesus did on the cross is sufficient. Nothing else has to be true. 
Nothing else they do, nothing else they believe. They don't have to have all the doctrines right. They don't have to have all their knowledge of the Bible right. They don't have to live a perfect Christian life. It's just the belief. That's their trust. That's a saved Christian. And then there are those whose trust has been placed in other things, whatever those things are. And Jesus uses the analogy of a house. He says, those who have built their house on that foundation, on the rock, on Christ and nothing else, they will weather the storms that come, the persecution that comes, the trials that come in their life. Those who have put their trust in anything else will quickly fall away at the first trial. How many people change religions in the face of some disaster in their life? The classic example in Christianity, if you want to say kind of broadly Christianity, the person who has a death in the family and that's their reason to stop going to church and to walk away from the church and to say, I don't believe in God anymore, I'm angry at God. You know, if he took my child away or if he took my spouse away, then I can't be a believer of his anymore. Christ says that's a house that was never built on a true foundation. And so the first time real trial came along, they're washed away. You're looking at an unbeliever. Or at the worst, you're looking at a believer who's simply in, den- in disobedience, in rebellion perhaps. Giving option there for both to be true perhaps. But if you are talking about an unbeliever, it's an example of this Lord, Lord, but I never knew you problem. By the time they were in church, they were saying, Lord, Lord, I'm a Christian. Yeah, praise God. First trial comes along and then you see who they really are. They're wiped away. Christ said, that's an example of someone who said, Lord, Lord, but never knew me. And their faith, having been shaken, is proof that their faith was not true. There is nothing that can undo the work of trust in God that God has done in the heart of a true believer. Nothing. Though you may feel anguish, though you may feel disappointment, though you may feel anger at God over some experience in your life, that will never rise up to the level where your faith in God departs, if it is true faith, because it was done by God in the first place. The faith was the product of God in the first place. You can't undo it any more than you did it. It is there by the power of God. Matthew, in talking about this same thing, Adds a couple of interesting verses. I'll read you from Matthew 7, 21. Listen to what he says. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, the thing that strikes me here about these verses, and these are the same essential verses, or these verses cover the same commentary from Christ that Luke is covering in chapter 6. In other words, we're talking about the same basic statements in both cases. Matthew just gives us this extra detail. What strikes me here about these verses is the sincerity of the people who are perishing. It is not as though these people come into eternity, into the judgment seat, into the great white throne judgment in this case because they're unbelievers. Stand before God and lie. It is not as though they're faking it, hoping to put one over on God at the last moment and get into heaven. They really believe what they're saying. These people said they were able to perform miracles in His name. And to some degree, I have to believe that's true, that they had some supernatural power probably made possible by the demonic realm. They also claimed to have prophesied. Arguably as well, by the demonic realm, some supernatural force, but clearly not God. And they were sure they were going to be saved. And they're surprised to find out they never knew Christ. Once again, what what does Jesus point to as evidence of the fact that he never knew them? That word for knew, I never knew you is the same word used to describe the kind of intimate knowledge that a husband has of his wife. The same word used to describe Mary as virgin. The word virgin, same word being used here for knew. I never knew you. This means it's not merely a knowledge we're talking about. It's not someone having a sense of maybe having heard of Jesus or even studied Jesus. It's a fundamental difference. It's a relationship, a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus that Christ says did not exist for this person. I never knew you. Folks, there are going to be people surprised to learn that they're not saved. 
And they can be known now for who they really are because when they say, Lord, Lord, they are not willing to live up to anything he says in the book. They use the words, but their life looks no different than the unbelieving world. They are those who've never known him. Now, what most believers bring into this moment is a bit of concern in their own mind, right? At some moment, you stop and say, well, wait a minute, how do I know I'm not one of these people? If you're worried about it, then you have nothing to be worried about. Because the unbelievers, they're never worried. Unbelievers don't sit around wondering about whether they're going to be saved. I've never met an unbeliever who lost a minute of sleep questioning whether or not they were going to be saved. It's only the believers who do that. It's the believers who sit around questioning, well, I know I believe, but I wonder if it was true or not. I know that sounds counter, but I want you to consider it is the enemy who plays with the mind of a believer to bring them to some kind of doubt that's not true. And in that moment of doubt, hopes to disarm them from any actions of their faith. The ones who are cocksure. Look at the Pharisees. There wasn't a Pharisee walking around in Jesus' day who thought they weren't going to go to heaven. It was the disciples who later wrote many of the letters of the epistles who sat around worrying about the fact that am I living up to this standard? Am I doing all that I can do? Oh, hopeless man am I. Look at all the sin I have, Paul says. The believer is the one who's convicted by the Holy Spirit. The believer is the one who understands there is holiness and that we have to live up to it and that we're pitifully short of it. Those are all concepts and thoughts that a believer has. Unbelievers don't worry about this. They show up in heaven, fat, dumb, and happy, and find out they're not a believer. You don't need to worry about this if in your heart right now your concern is over this. But if in your heart right now there's a concern over, you know, I've never really thought about my faith this way. I've never really thought of Christ as my only hope. I've never really seen faith in this sense. Then maybe this is God pulling on your heart so that you would know the truth. And an opportunity exists still for you to confess his name. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that these people were going to exist in their ministry just as much as they exist for us today. And in both cases, the ones that existed for Jesus and for the disciples in his day and for the ones we encounter today, they can be known by their fruit. They practice lawlessness, Christ says. They're hypocrites. Their life reflects nothing of Jesus' teachings. And as we end today, that's my challenge for you as well. Where are you today? Can you say your life is a picture of Jesus' teaching? Now, I'm not putting this to you as a test of your faith. I don't think that in this moment that's the best sense of it. I think the better sense of it for you now is not so much as a test of your faith, but how much just a test of your witness? Do we call him Lord on Sunday and then live a life that looks like the unbelieving world the rest of the week? Remember, it's not our actions that save us. That we know. But Jesus says it is our behavior that reveals our hearts. And what is your behavior? What is my behavior? Saying about our hearts. Father, we do pray as we end the teaching today that uh, the behavior that the world sees in us would reflect you because it would reflect a true heart of faith. Father, we learn these things out of your word. We understand the teachings of your son. But, Father, I do pray we apply them as well. That those, Father, who are merely hearers of the word are hypocrites. Those who, Father, on on the other hand, are believers in the Word and doers of the Word. They are your sons, Father. They are the true bride of your Son. We pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit, through the power of this Word spoken, would change hearts. First, Father, for the unbeliever, whoever it may be, in this room or hearing these words at a later time, I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would work actively in their heart as they listen to the Word of God preached. And it would be enough, Father, that they might come to know the truth and turn away, Father, from a life that trusts in other things. And then secondly, Father, for the believer, the one who is to be built up and edified and strengthened by the Word, I pray, Father, that that would take place, that there would be a commitment, Father, a recommitment to living a life that reflects their faith, going to those who might persecute and embracing the enemy wherever he or she may be and never backing down from a loving presentation of the gospel message in the little things, Father, and in the big things, in small opportunities as you provide them. Let us stand strong, Father, in the gospel, both in our own lives and then in our witness and 
our spread of the gospel message. Let others, Father, learn from us and see you reflected in us. Let the kingdom grow, Father, because of our obedience, but by your power. For it is only by your power, Father, that men may be saved, by only the name of Christ. And we're so thankful that we were given that opportunity. We as well, Father, end thanking you for the opportunity to meet for this building. Again, Father, for the provision of so many who have made it possible to meet. For Daniel and his presentation of worship, Father, I give you thanks as well. Let us go out, Father, this morning in praise, drawing from that deep well within us to do good, to speak good, Father, from a heart that you changed. And if it be your will, Lord, I pray that next week this group would regather under the teaching of Brian and would again, Father, give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.